Why metrics? Um, here is a little quote that uh, we put out that uh, we believe that uh, metrics are the instruments to take calculated risks necessary to step ever further into the unknown of innovation. And um, hopefully that will be picked up and attributed to Albert Einstein in the future, but uh, right now is something that we like to say because um, today, as we all know, like corporations are struggling to operate in Horizon 3 ventures. And I'm not a big a fan of the uh, this naming Horizon 3, but let's use it now because it's easy to, to indicate what we know. So uh, companies, it, it's, not, it's not news, right? Companies are being, uh, uh, trying to create disruptive innovations just to keep up with the pace from competitors like uh, Amazon, Tesla that are now innovating cross industries and not to mention all the challengers, startups and et cetera that are just popping up across the roof. And when corporations start to, the solution for that, of course, is okay, let's, let's build these new disruptive innovations ourselves. And once they try to do that, they start to face a lot of roadblocks, most of them uh, be, uh, because of you know, the current processes and how things are just structured within the company. Uh, I'm not gonna mention all these pro uh, uh, roadblocks. I think everyone's quite aware of most of them, but I'd like to talk a little bit about why this is happening. So as Martin said very well in the, the opening, so today, like great companies, they are built around operational excellence and predictability. And they are purposely designed to mitigate risk, right? So that is how you achieve operational excellence and predictability. But innovation, it's, it's uncertainty, right? We're told about to embrace uncertainty, but what, wait, let's, let's just scratch that. I think that innovation is actually risk. And, and what, is, what is the difference? Because once you measure uncertainty, then it becomes risk. And I like a lot that definition because risk is manageable. Uncertainty is not. And don't just take my word for it. So Frank Knight, um, he was the, one of the fa fathers of the Chicago School of Economic Theory. And in his book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, he gives this very clear definition that uncertainty stems from events that are unpredictable and as such cannot be prepared against. While risk stems from repeated events, which therefore allow probabilities to be calculated and factored into decisions. And I also like the ISO 31000, which is the International Standard for Risk Measurement, that says about risk assessment, which is recognizing and characterizing risks and evaluating their significance to support decision making. So it's actually the combination of these two definitions, how we at Trimaran aim to look at innovation and, and take these calculated risks, uh, do the decision making to take these calculated risks and step into uh, what is this known H3 innovation. So what is innovation from a risk perspective? Let's first look at what happens when you try to create innovation in a risk averse environment. I think we've all been to a place where, oh, I need 5K, 5K and, and an intern. I just need to test start an idea. And companies, usually they're very uh, uh, um, culture oriented for that and say, yes, let's do that, let's innovate. Let's go through, uh, apply for that budget. And then when you need, just as a five-year plan, 128 PPT slides, go through HR policies to get that, that intern in. You need an eight-month wait until the budget meeting happens. You need to go through all these political battles. And then when you look at it, your 5K project became a 3.5 million one. And what happened in that is exactly uh, the exact opposite what the process was designed to do. It made your risk go through the roof. And when that happens, the consequence of it is that it inhibits innovation, right? Because first and foremost, it increases people's own individual risk. What would your people say that, oh, if, if I fail with 5K, it's fine. Oh, I'm gonna fail with 3 million. Mm, what's the incentive that they have to go out, put themselves in the limb uh, on the limb to, to 
to try to get these, these disruptive innovations out there. Uh, they don't really have one. So they end up doing H1, H2 innovation instead of building what could be something really extraordinary. So another key aspect of, of how we measure things today is um, uh, accounting. I think uh, most of you have heard about uh, innovation accounting, but when you look at, let's talk about like traditional financial accounting. Traditional financial accounting is looking at what we call post facto metrics, right? Metrics that KPIs that happen after the fact, and we're talking about revenues, market share, net sales, and et cetera. If your project, if your project, your product, they generate these metrics, they're called assets. If they don't generate them, they're simply called liabilities. So they're a cost center. And we all know that H3 innovation not necessarily produce um, revenues. But the thing is value is being created throughout that process. And that's what innovation accounting comes in to play and saying, look, we can actually measure what's happening uh, uh, throughout this process. And, and, and start to identify and, and, and start to predict these possible outcomes and where this is going, right? So for example, uh, one of my startups, uh, for maybe the first two years, we did, I don't know, roughly three to $5,000 in revenue. So basically it was a total flop. Our investors wanted to kill us. Every month was like, what's that five figure, six figure number that I was looking to see every month and, and there's nothing to show. And it was a really hard times, really hard conversations that we had with them on a constant basis, but we had to convince them. We had to show them that look, value is being created. And what happened was we had validated the problem. We had validated the customer. We validated our algorithm, but the interface, the channel that we were distributing it to the customer, that was what, what, what we invalidated. So and then eventually we pivoted to become an API and um, in the end, we found product market fit, et cetera, and eventually sold the company. So, but, but the value was there. So we eventually convinced them, we got more money and we were able to, to move forward. But I think because of having so many of these hard conversations that became so metrics focused, uh, 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 almost paranoid, now I love this. And uh, I really want to, to tell people out there because there is a tool that I didn't know back then. Uh, so, now, instead, when we look at innovation accounting, what we're talking about is not outcome metrics, but we're also actually talking about growth, right? And growth is, is an indicator that uses time as a variable, is how much a certain item increases in a period of time. And when we start to talk about time, we're talking about speed as well. So, and this is what we call progress metrics, right? So before, like when you're still doing, doing your, your prototypes, you're testing, you're validating your assumptions, et cetera, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, um, uh, progress metrics and how fast you can go through them. So the goal while you're doing your uh, measuring your value creation is to take all your assumptions all the way to invalidation. And this might sound a bit counterintuitive because we all say that we need to validate our assumptions, but actually failing fast, what everyone talks about, that really cool buzzword, it's not about killing, it's about killing things fast, but it's actually about killing your bad assumptions fast and your bad projects, right? Um, why is that? So there's, this, there's a validation hierarchy that you must go through to find product market fit. You, you, you can't validate your problem and scale, right? You need to validate your customer, you need to validate your business model, et cetera, when you're talking about disruptive innovation when you're going into the unknown. If you have other validated assumptions, then really it's different, but then you're not necessarily talking about uh, H3 innovations. Uh, but, and the, the thing is, the further you go through this validation hierarchy, uh, more measurements you're making. How fast you're going, how many experiments, how many assumptions, how many evidences. And uh, that, is when um, uncertainty starts to become risk. And why, why do you need to go fast? Because the faster you go, the sooner you have um, clarity of your pathway, pathway to growth, right? 
uh, the, the faster you move through it, the more de-risked you eventually become. The faster you move through it, uh, quicker you get to, uh, is your time to market. And that not necessarily means revenue, but it's your competitive advantage. So why is this important to venture capitalists? So more than, I don't say more, but of course, venture capitalists, when I ask people like, what, what, what is their main objective? Yeah, maximize profitability, bring returns to their, to their limited partners, et cetera. But one of these top three is that people usually overlook is they actually want de-risked investments, right? VC is already a risky game. They're looking at the 100 startups a month, evaluating all of them, and all of them have this huge potential. They're coming out with, you know, blood in their eyes, thirst to disrupt all of the all of your corporations out there. Um, and they all have huge potential markets. They have huge potential gains. But which do they choose? Where do they allocate the resources? They want to look at those that have proven themselves that have the highest probability of actually reaching those goals and, and acquiring those markets and disrupting those industries. And of course, combined with that, they're maximizing their profitability. And how do they do that? First of all, they make a lot of bets, right? To find a unicorn, it's a one to 2%, if so. So you need at least 100 investments happening. So, and the key takeaway here is that failed investments don't matter. You can't have that mentality to say, oh, I can't fail. In the end, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. It's statistics, right? So they know how to fail fast and they use that at a portfolio level as well. They make big bets. So they swing for the fence, right? They're not playing safe. There might be some H1, H2 comparable uh, 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 startups that they invest in, but they're already looking at someone that's going to dominate market and potentially be acquired or et cetera. So these are always big, but it must have a huge reach in terms of a huge size market. They de-risk. How, how do they do that? As I said, they see hundred deals with huge potential, all of them. Uh, and to choose the, the less risky ones, they have some sort of indicators that they're looking at that have their, also, their own hierarchy as well. So they're looking at, uh, is the customer need really there? Is there a big market? Is there a great team? Do they have fresh, good ideas? Uh, do they have paying customers? So I don't know if you noticed, this is, this is going up as we move forward, as these startup evolves, they start to get these boxes checked. Like, uh, there's this venture capital fund called NFX. Uh, you should look it up. They have great cotton there. Uh, they have this thing called the ladder of proof where they show exactly uh, how VCs are looking at these, this kind of hierarchy of indicators. And some of them, as I said, is a hierarchy, some are more important than others. So let's say you're talking about paying customers. If you don't have such a great team, but you have paying customers, well, you're, you're, an, uh, uh, you're already ahead of the curve. So you're already more attractive. And you keep on going, you have good unit economics, you have scalable growth acquisition channels. And, and the biggest one of all is rapid growth. That is what they're looking at. So it doesn't even matter if you don't have revenues. If you're, if you're acquiring, if your user, your active user base, for example, is growing 10 to 15% week over week, oh, come here, why did I sign that check? That's, that's what I'm looking for. Also, they know it's a numbers game, right? So just think of it as, as a sales funnel. We all know that we need to talk to 100 leads to get one sale, right? And that's the same thing with, with uh, uh, HD Innovation, with startups. They want to, as you go through those leads, the faster you hang up the phone and unqualify a lead, right? And you invalidate your assumption that that was a good sale, the faster you move on to the next one. So you have 98 more to go until you get that close. Um, you, you save time and therefore you save money, right? Hang, you're not on the phone just talking about, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, you potentially learn a new problem that maybe you're not addressing it now, but you already know it. It's already there in the market. Uh, and you improve your sales pitch. So that is why this is something that's always on their mind. They know it's a numbers game and they pay, play that beautifully. 
And last is uh, they have a diversified and a balanced portfolio. So some people might disagree on this, but um, when it comes to corporations, but VCs, they aren't afraid to let startups sometimes go out of scope. Sometimes they're like, oh, but I'm, I'm moving too far away from my original objective. But that is just part of the discovery process that is called innovation because you're, you're, you're going to the, the next frontier. You're going where no man has been before. And what that happens is sometimes you think you're going to step on a, a, a small green stone with your right foot and then you, you actually step on a big leaf to the left that is, I don't know, about to fly because that's how innovation happens. Things change. So you must be open for that to be diversified. And you need that also to find the home runs because otherwise, if we all knew where the home runs was, we wouldn't have, have be having this conversation right now. And in the end, uh, after that, it's also very key to balance the balance the portfolio because there are shifts, and each fund, each company has a different level of acceptance to risk, of tolerance of risk, etc. So you need to balance your your portfolio according to that. So. As I said, this is a home run game. It's a not an average game. We all know that, of course, uh, you see the, the chart on the left, 65% of, of uh, ventures usually fail. They get less than, than their invested money back. It's a fat tail distribution. Uh, but what we do see is that the best investment funds, they usually have more strikeouts than the average fund, right? That's, that's kind of like what, what we've been talking about so far. Uh, so far. But another key thing is that most people don't know is that the best investment funds, they also have bigger wins than the average fund. What does that mean? You need a one out of 100 chance to hit a unicorn. So all the companies that you must be looking at, they must be unicorns, potential unicorns. They're not looking, oh, yeah. I understand that sometimes you need to have in your portfolio some strategic plays that are not supposed to make revenue, not supposed to have rapid growth. But if you want to be building innovations and, and playing this numbers game, this is something that you must be very aware of. Your big bets must be bigger than everyone else's other bets. And what, and what needs to be aligned for fast to happen in your company, right? For us, these are four very fundamental pillars. And as you can see in the background picture, I hope you can, you can't really be fast with just three wheels, you need all four of them. So the first one are lean processes. Why lean processes? First of all, when you apply lean, you automatically have a shift in mindset. Lean, for you to apply lean, you need to be customer centric. You, you can't be product centric. Uh, uh, you start to think about the problem being solved, not the solution. And one of the things I love about it is that everything is an assumption from the get go. It's, and, and it's very easy for you to fall in love with your product. I've done that a million times. I've made so many mistakes because of that. Uh, and, and Lean, actually, when you start to really play the methodology, it starts to make you think uh, on a daily basis uh, and your mind like that and your mindset starts to shift. You start to get early validations. So you give your people autonomy and freedom to just test because now they can get those 5K and that intern from their own budget or whatever or even not spend nothing at all and start doing testing, just calling clients and said, hey, there's this problem, do you have this problem? Do you mind if I come in and, and ask you a few questions? So, and then you start to measure that and you start to get your validations and the bad ideas, they get eliminated at the get-go. And as a consequence of that, you start to get, when it's time to actually fund the ideas that come through you, through your ideation initiatives, your design thinking sprints, your hackathons, et cetera, they come, they come to you as evidence-based projects and not ideas, which is a lot more structured and metered. The second is budget. So uh, I'm pretty sure as well you've heard about trench funding. If you haven't, we can talk about it later. Uh, but basically, trench funding allows you to have many small projects that have really low risk instead of a few big projects that carry a lot of risk we've talked about before. Second of all, once you do that, you're in the numbers game, right? We have limited amount of resources, so you need to test 100. So you, you might as well, you need to have something that just spreads out 10, 15, 50K, 100K uh, uh, um, 
uh, projects going on, and a bunch of them, then a few. Um, and it increases your innovation ROI. What does that mean? So if you're killing your projects fast, you're, you're testing them with very little money, you invalidate at some point spending, let's say you have a, a 2 million budget, you spent 100,000 so far, you invalidated it at one point, you just, you just saved 1.9 million. And one, once they get reinvested, first of all, you got 1.9 as, as, as a cost saving ROI. Second, uh, once that starts getting reinvested, you start to test more ideas. And just statistically, as you can see down there, it's like once you start to test more ideas, you increase the likelihood of success or validate whatever is the success rate you're trying to reach. Third is transparency, right? Full visibility, no more black box. Everyone needs to know what's, what's happening throughout the organization, not only for people to uh, understand and see what's going on cross siloed, which is super key to help validate, invalidate projects assumptions faster, because a lot of times the information is already inside the company, it's just siloed. Uh, it helps you give access to other markets that another business unit have access to that you don't. Uh, and it gives you uh, budget efficiency. Uh, I've, I've talked to companies that they're like, oh, we have two, three different startups being invested in by three different business units, and they're all drones and they do kind of the same thing. And money is being spent and they're not seeing that. And one of the key things, the things most important about this, when you have this full visibility as well, is you make very clear for people how it is if they want to bring their idea to product how it works, it's very transparent. They know it could be a hard way to get there. They need to like push a rock up a hill, but they know what they need to do if they have an idea and they wanna bring it to, to scale to a product to market. And last but not least, metrics. So metrics, I think the key thing is it gives you a baseline for comparison. So ventures, ideas, projects, they comes in all shapes and sizes. Once you start to measure progress metrics, you start to have a baseline for comparison between them. So even if they're in different horizons, even if they have different budgets, et cetera, you start to have, you, you know how fast they're being de-risked. And then you can just evaluate that based on the market size, on, on the budget, et cetera, how much, what's the, the opportunity cost that you have to allocate resources to, to venture A or venture B and so forth. It allows you to have a faster analysis and decision-making, right? So now you have the numbers right in front of you. You don't have to, uh, uh, people, do, you kind of mitigate the salesman pitch and the politics going in and say, oh, this is why my projects will get the budget and et cetera. You have, you, now you have a lot of numbers. Um, and I don't think metrics are going to be, the, there's always going to be a human uh, decision there. That's why I said it's risk combined with decision-making. I think the human factor is always going to be there because uh, some decisions need to be strategic. Uh, but it does, uh, help you be a lot more focused and directed to, to what that means. Uh, it, it measures progress, not outcomes. And it also helps support a lot when it's time to pivot, kill, or persevere uh, when you reach one of these uh, um, crossroads with your venture. And when you have these four combined, well, you get a super efficient venture building machine. And let me show you how. When, we, when you start, the first thing you start doing is what we call opportunity scoring. And these are pre-validation metrics, right? These are our traditional KPIs. These are all assumptions, like what is the total market size? Not necessarily 100% assumptions, but you have this, this information in the market. Your research team usually have access to this information pretty easily. What's your serviceable market? What is the percentage that you want to acquire? What are your goals? Does it bring unique value to the customer? And we, we score those, like what is the total investment needed, et cetera. Um, we give a baseline score for that so that you can start having your first analysis even before you go to the validate, just to make sure like, okay, does it make sense to pursue this? Take step one, yeah, okay, it's good. Uh, let's keep on going. It's very easy, everyone knows how to do this. And then you start to go to what I call the, uh, I said it's like the, the uh, validation hierarchy is the de-risking path, right? You need to go from problem validation to the solution value hypothesis, which is, do I bring value to the customer? And I'm retaining customers. I think that's a very important KPI to validate your value hypothesis. Is my business model working? 
And then only then when you go through this, these stages, uh, you get to the growth hypothesis. Okay, what are my channels? How do I scale this? Do I have the, the right channels to, to, to get this out in the world? Uh, and once you do have that, then you can say that you've somewhat already found product market fit. Of course, you already have revenues at this point in most cases, uh, especially if you're B2B. And uh, that is when it's potentially uh, the, the venture is ready to be uh, reintegrated into the mothership, roll out in the business unit, and, and then corporations just, you do what you do best and you just scale that. But now it's already been highly de-risked. So before, when you had a three million project, when you're still validating the problem or validating the solution, is very different when you have a three million dollar project when you've gone through this whole maturity stage. And now you also have names to say, okay, in which stage are uh, which maturity level is my venture? Is it more high risk, low risk, etc.? And then you have a product development path, right? Uh, and the, these are also very well known. Uh, a lot of people address these as stage gates. I don't like that definition simply because the fact that uh, I like to see this more as a continuum because stage gates are basically, you already have the product defined and then you just chop it in pieces and your validation is an outcome against a predefined timeline. You only validated that, yeah, I reached the, the, the goal on time. That's not it. Sometimes with your MVP, you could potentially just validate your problem, your solution, your value hypotheses, and then you're up to exponential growth and you're still with an MVP product. There are cases of those. And uh, so it's, it's more like a flux and more of a, an orientation. So it's not really a, a, a straight line, but it's a good way to understand where you are um, in terms of product development. And then you, you, we get into the, the key points, which are the project progress metrics, right? So how do, what are we measuring as the ventures move through this, this, uh, this, this, this pipeline, this validation hierarchy, right? So once it's still in the problem validation phase, et cetera, you start to looking at what are the, how many key assumptions am I testing, right? Out of those, how many experience am, am I running for each, each assumption, each idea that's being tested? How many are being validated? How many are being invalidated? What's my validation to invalidation ratio? If that is close to one, that means that all the assumptions that you're coming out with, you're putting out to test, you're coming back with an answer, which is a great indicator. So, and how fast am I moving through this? How many experiments am I running uh, uh, per week? Uh, and then you can easily escalate that to see in, in terms of month and quarters and so on. Uh, and, and, how, and velocity is how fast am I moving from one stage to the next, from one maturity level to the next? Which, because it's, even though if you're making a lot of experiments in a period of week time, but if you're not moving forward, you're not, you're not really progressing. So these are some of the elements you start to look at. And uh, when you start to have these in all your projects, in all your ventures, now you start to have the comparables. So you know how fast they're going from one stage to the next. You know how fast they're testing assumptions. And even, let's say, if you have a, a, a venture that goes all, walks a, a good way until, I don't know, the value hypothesis, the business model validation, and then it completely invalidates, you decide to kill it, um, it doesn't mean that you, you, you just lost that money. Potentially you had some, you had valid, but you, know, you did have validated learning that time. Potentially you found a new market, a new customer to address and so on. So you never start from scratch, uh, for the next iteration. And you also validated your team. So if you did that in a timely manner and cost effectively, even though you invalidated all your assumptions, you, you definitely proven that your team, you can throw another venture at, him, at them and they'll probably do the same thing. And, and uh, uh, hopefully it will, this time they, they will open that path towards growth. And then now you start to compare these ventures with all these metrics. You start to look, okay, which one is a home run, right? You're looking at 
the opportunity size. Well, what is the cost of opportunity of velocity? Some things that I already mentioned there. Success probability is more down the line when you start to have results, then you can start identify patterns in that. Um, which be best balances my portfolio? I'm gonna talk a little bit that uh, uh, ahead, how much is my allocation per maturity stage and so on. And this is how your portfolio and your pipeline is gonna to start to look like, right? And you're gonna have some ventures on the ideation stage, you're gonna have some ventures that are an MVP validating the solution. Some will be more ahead, some will be uh, still an MVP, but validating the business model, but already validating the business model and so forth. And it is a funnel, right? Because we are failing fast as well. The same way we do with assumptions, the same way we, that lean is applied at a project level, you apply lean at a portfolio level. So you're starting to kill your ventures uh, very fast, right? So once you start doing that, as I said, you're saving up money, you're reinvesting, you're testing more ideas, you're increasing your success rate, you're, you're having big discoveries, you're having big validated, validated learning, you're spending little money to get that information, to get that knowledge, you're validating your team, and then uh, because you're testing more ideas, this virtuous cycle that starts to happen is you start to have better products in your pipeline, better ventures in your pipeline. You start to have better products coming on uh, as an output. And once you start having better products in the market, you also start having, you start attracting better talent and then that you start to have better ideas coming in and, and, and that just goes on and on. And once you have these ventures in your portfolio, you need to start looking at them uh, from the risk perspective, right? How do I balance my portfolio? So these are just a few metrics saying looking by horizon and maturity level. So I know that if I have a lot of resources allocated in er, let's call it early stage ventures, right? This on the problem phase, the customer validation phase, etc., the risk of my portfolio is is high. So potentially there's and if there's there's no ventures getting ready to be get scaled, so we need to address there's something going on. So speed is not going well, teams are not performing. What there's a bottleneck somewhere that needs to be addressed. The same if the same thing happens on the other end, let's say you have a uh, few ventures getting ready to scale, none in the early stage, your risks are lower, but at the same time, your innovation machine, it's starting to stop. And, you, and this is a constant ongoing movement. It never ends. You're becoming, a, this is what makes you a serial innovator, right? You need to have this pipeline very, uh, its vitality very high. So ideas need to be coming in all the time so that you can be playing that numbers game very well. Um, so I guess this kind of wraps up the whole idea of, of uh, uh, I know it's a lot of information. I didn't want to go too deep in many things, but uh, uh, I'm at your disposal to talk later, 101, more specifics. But I think the key takeaways that I have for this today, and then we can go into questions, is uh, first of all, be lean. You don't, in my opinion, even though a lot of big consultants are going to say otherwise, you don't need a five-year transformational project to implement this. Uh, because the same way as the project happens, the risk is just too high. This is a habit thing. It's just a daily thing that you start tweaking things here and there, doing small things every day, and then you're going to start to see change. Second, you need to apply lean. And once you apply lean, you start to shift the mindset towards being customer centric. Then you start measuring progress. Uh, and you can do that right from the get go. Uh, these these metrics uh, aren't aren't hard today. Most people already know a little bit of lean. You have software to support that. Uh, then once you have that going, already in a few weeks you can start to be able to compare your ventures, and then you start to select which are the home runs, and and select the de-risked ones, please. And um, then you just go build your unicorns, right? Don't forget to balance your portfolio. That's quite important, but now you have it. Now you're in the game and you're ready to um, build H3 innovations. Uh, I would say even more efficiently than a venture capital would. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, uh, Rafael. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, Joyce, uh, are you able to use your microphone for, the, for your question? Yes. Um, so thank you, Rafael, for this excellent uh, presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the metric of uh, speed of learning of learning velocity. Um, so if if you make experiments, uh, the basis of comparison, also the assumption, my concern is that uh, assumptions are not equal in size. Um, so there are big assumptions and small assumptions, and also, and also there are big experiments and small experiments. And if you start rate assessing the teams on their uh, learning velocity and the number of experiments they uh, are validated or are invalidating, then the danger is that they only choose the small experiments that they are pretty sure that that uh, so they will be biased towards smaller experiments and they will avoid the larger and more riskier experiments so how do you avoid that 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 is a great question uh, and thank you for that uh, so it is it is a challenge because uh experiments can uh, defer but once again uh, you're going to be breaking those down into into uh, uh weekly basis but i think the key thing is when you're working with lean uh, to avoid that bias, that, that bias towards the, the, the faster uh, experiments, you need to start with your risk as assumption, right? It's, have you, have, uh, there's this, uh, Google has this uh, philosophy, I guess, I don't know, they call it uh, monkey first, right? Uh, it's actually Alphabet has this, I don't know if you heard about this. They say that, um, how is it? It's, oh, I want to have a monkey recite Shakespeare on a pedestal. What is the first thing that you do? You train the monkey, right? Because if you can't do that, you don't have anything else. Uh, what people usually tend to do is go build the pedestal, which I think is what you're kind of saying, because it's just easier, it's already there, we know how to do it. But once that is also part of building the capabilities and talking to people and, and being there, so that it, it, it doesn't really work if you're not testing the risk as assumptions uh, from the get-go. So I think is that is a good way to mitigate a little bit of that that uh, uh, problem that might happen in 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 terms of of different experiments. I think when it's time to compare the ventures, uh, even though uh, if you have let's say an experiment that's going to take I don't know uh, a month, uh, and and another experiment that can be finished out in a week, I think the number of validations and and uh, uh, and evidence, not validation stuff, but evidence that you're bringing in on a weekly basis could start giving you some parameters. And then, of course, there's a little bit of a, a, a more human look into it to understand how you can compensate one one towards the other. I hope that that answered your question. So you really should look into the contents of the validation and also assess um, whether they actually have started with the larger assumptions. Yeah, definitely start with the large assumption, the riskiest assumption, not necessarily yeah. the largest, but... Yeah, but the riskiest, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Bry, you also have an additional question to, to this question of Joyce? Oh, no, that, that, that comes to the same point. Uh, uh, you can ask uh, each project to, to fulfill uh, uh, a risk versus evidence uh, matrix. Uh, that is to say, um, a matrix where they run their assumption uh, toward what is critical and where we lack evidence. Yeah, thank you. So, um, there's another question uh, from Neda. Are you able to use your microphone, Neda? Yes, hi. Uh, a very simple question. Can we apply this process for H1 incremental ideas, like uh, developing features for already existing solutions? Well, that's actually like the bulk or 70, 90% is uh, these kind of developments. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, Nita. Uh, yes, I, the, the, the process is, is, is still the same. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit easier for H1 because you have uh more information and more validated assumption right to to have access to more evidence so so i i, I would assume that just your your pathway to to, to de-risking is, is just a bit faster but if you think about it just as lean at a product level right 
as a product development, it's kind of putting out features to your new, to, to whatever is your, your, your software, your CRM, et cetera. You, every time that you're launching uh, uh, a new feature, it's, it's, you're talking about H1, H2 innovation incremental uh, into that. And the process is exactly the same. Does that answer your question, Ada? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Patricia, you also had a question for Rafael. Yes, hi, thanks. Great presentation. Um, I was wondering how do you align, or maybe you don't at all, uh, the metrics that you outlined with the traditional metrics of the mothership? So I've seen a tendency from HQ to still sort of force feed and you know get our initiatives to fill out their templates, their financial KPIs, and it, it's not focused on progress. And so how do you deal with that tension? Yeah, so that I think that is a a dragon that all of us are trying to slay at one point because it it, it is a problem. It's it's what I mentioned in the beginning, right? The the two processes, the two accounting standards, they just don't talk. Um, one of the research that we're doing internally, and I think it's going to become end up become my life goal or something, is I do want to at one point uh, uh, we're doing a research and study to how do I connect these progress metrics to start creating predictability to what is the actual sales and the ROI and et cetera. So once you have that, once you start, where we are so far is once you start having ventures coming out, you start to understand what works, what doesn't, uh, what kind of uh, team structure you need, what kind of products based on, on your comments and so on. And, and once that starts to refeed the, the, uh, the loop and, and the pipeline, then you can start to have this kind of predictability and link that to, to uh, ROI. So right now it is still a challenge. So I think what needs, what I've heard a lot of great talkers, actually innovators saying like, is you need to have this conversation uh, with, with the mothership and what's happening right now, the, the ROI that you can give is how much money you're saving by just killing the ventures fast. And if, if today is the, let's say, innovation has a million a year budget and it's already seen as a cost, it's already written off as a cost, then just keep it that way. But internally, you're, you're looking and you're measuring and you're seeing how you're moving forward and you're seeing how much money you're saving, how much more efficient you're becoming with that one million. And then you can start to talk to them and say, look, this is what's happening. This is what's doing on. And when you have the transparency there, they can also see how fast, not just how fast or how they're progressing, but for example, one of the opportunity scoring metrics that I, I really like to address is like, where do you want to be right in five, 10 years? Oh, I want to have 10, 15% of my revenues coming from e-commerce. Okay. So that's where we want, we need to go. That's our thesis. That's where... So once there's, you can see all the projects and you can see how fast you're going, that's a good way for you to start tying that as well. So look, this is how I'm progressing towards to reach our 15% goal in, in, in e-commerce. I know the dots are all there to, to connect these points. I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm going to get there soon. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Well, Rafael, uh, thank you. We are uh, getting close to the end of, the, of, this, uh, of this session. Uh, so we learned a lot from you. I really liked uh, the, uh, the, the car approach with the four wheels and uh, the, the lean process, the budgeting, the transparency and the metrics. And uh, we also learned from you that uh, it's not only about uh, uh, if you measure growth, it's not the outcome, but the progress, which, you, which is really important. And uh, also to, to start with these risky assumptions and, and to connect with the mothership, use the thesis, the innovation fees of the mothership. Maybe one final question. Um, if you have one uh, tip for corporate innovators, if they want to start with this kind of metrics, because I know a lot of innovators who are uh, very good at the creative process, at, at using post-its and, and that kind of DNA, uh, what, what would be the first step for people to use this more blue metrics kind of approach? What, what is your tip? Uh, that's a great question, Martin. Thank you. I think that if you're already good with, if you're already mastering the post-its, probably you're already mastering a uh, business model canvas, you're pr probably mastering lean. 
So that's already a great step that you already took. You're already way ahead of the game. Uh, I think now is just to understand, are you putting the riskiest assumptions there? Now you need to start, it's a lot more, it's a lot less about metrics and the innovation process, but more of a project management process. That's, that's what starts to kick in because now you need to tell your teams, okay, you know how to do lean, right? So this is what happens when you put out an experiment. You need just not, you now just need to start timing. What are the experiments that you're making? How are you reaching out to the client? How are you reaching out to all these assumptions that you laid out already in the canvas and, and, and just start tracking that. So I think the, this, this would be the best way to just give the first step and, and what, because you need to collect the data. I think that is the key thing. And once you have that data on, now you can start looking at it and start assessing the risk and balancing portfolio, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody who is attending this session. Uh, I've posted a link for the other sessions in the agenda and I hope to see you all in other sessions the coming week. And uh, Rafael, again, thank you very much for your time and energy. No, thank you all. It was great being here.